Bernoulli's Principle. Ever gaze skyward wondering how those colossal metal birds defy gravity? It's all about physics, specifically Bernoulli's Principle. Imagine air as crowded as a dance floor. Faster movement means less pressure. Daniel Bernoulli, an 18th century brainiac, nailed this down. Airplane wings. With their curved tops and flatter bottoms, force air to speed up above, creating lower pressure than beneath. This pressure difference generates lift, the invisible force that keeps planes aloft. No flapping required. Why do planes soar so high? Commercial airliners typically cruise around 10,000 meters in the troposphere. It's a sweet spot. Less turbulence, fewer storms, and thinner air, which translate to smoother rides and better fuel efficiency. Fighter jets, those adrenaline junkies, often venture into the stratosphere, sometimes exceeding 21,000 meters. Now, here's a curveball. Airplanes don't fly in straight lines. The Earth is a sphere, so the shortest distance between two points is a curve, known as the Great Circle Route. That's why your flight from New York to Tokyo might take you over Alaska, not straight across the Pacific. It's not a detour, it's geometry at work. And about that myth that planes avoid oceans, utter nonsense. They fly over them all the time. However, safety regulations mandate that twin-engine aircraft stay within a certain distance of an airport. This ensures they can make an emergency landing if needed, hence those zigzag routes across the vast oceans. It's not fear of the deep blue, it's prudent planning. Newton's Third Law of Motion Newton's Third Law of Motion might sound like something out of an old science textbook, but if you've ever seen a jet take off, you've witnessed it in action. This law, stating that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, is the reason planes fly, rockets launch, and why if you push a wall, the wall pushes back, even if your ego says otherwise. In aviation, this law is working 24-7 from liftoff to landing. Think about a plane's engine. It forcefully throws air backward and in response the plane surges forward. That's thrust, the superstar of this equation. Birds use the same trick flapping their wings downward to generate an opposite upward lift. Even rockets obey the rule by spewing fiery gas downwards, forcing themselves into the sky. Without Newton's third law, we'd still be staring up at the sky wishing we could fly. But it's not just about going forward. Planes must battle four forces. Thrust, pushing forward, drag pulling back, lift pulling up, and weight dragging down. A skilled pilot has to play puppet master, keeping all these forces in check. Want to turn? Tilt the wings, but brace for a flight. One wing generates more lift than the other, creating unwanted drag. That's where the rudder steps in, evening things out. Even something as basic as flying level requires constant adjustments. Now, let's settle a classic aviation debate, Newton versus Bernoulli. While Newton says wings push air downward to create lift, Bernoulli's principle says fast-moving air over the wing lowers pressure, pulling the plane up. Four forces of flight. Now, let's dissect the magic behind flight. It's not just waving your arms and hoping for the best. It's a delicate dance of four fundamental forces, weight, lift, drag, and thrust. First up, weight, gravity. That relentless force pulls everything down, your plane included. Pack heavy and you'll feel its wrath. Remember, the center of gravity isn't just an aviation term. It's also where your wallet lightens post-ticket purchase. Pilots are constantly adjusting controls to maintain balance as burning fuel alters the plane's weight. It's science, folks. Then there's lift, the superhero of aviation. It's what stops your plane from becoming an expensive plummeting paperweight. Air flowing over the wings creates lift, defying gravity. Yes, even that plush first class seat contributes. Lift acts perpendicular to the flight path, essentially pushing the plane upwards. Fail to generate enough lift and you're in for a rapid unscheduled descent. Now, let's address drag, the invisible buzzkill. Ever felt like you're battling a gale force wind? That's drag. Air resists movement, and the faster you go, the more it pushes back. Sleek aerodynamic designs are crucial to minimize drag. That's why planes look like streamlined tubes, not flying refrigerators. Finally, thrust. The engine's contribution. Engines don't lift the plane. They shove it forward. In Newton's third law in action, hot gas blasts backwards, propelling the plane forward. Need more thrust? Bigger engines. Harrier jets. Those rebels. Cheat by pointing their engines downward for vertical takeoffs. Because sometimes rules are meant to be broken. Aerodynamic stability and control. So, aviation enthusiasts, let's unpack the thrilling world of aircraft stability and control. Picture trying to balance a feather in a tempest. That's the essence of keeping a multi-ton aircraft steady. Imagine you're piloting, and a sudden gust of wind throws you off course. Does your plane calmly return to its path, or does it decide to perform an impromptu aerial ballet? 
That's stability in action. If it's the former, you're good. If it's the latter, grab a parachute and a strong brew. We've got static stability, the plane's initial, nope, I'm going back reaction. Then there's dynamic stability, its long-term response, like settling after a wobble or spiraling into a roller coaster ride. Think of it as a quick stumble versus a full-blown clumsy episode. But it's not just design. Forces like aerodynamics, inertia, gravity, and engine thrust all play a part. And let's not forget the pilot, frantically adjusting controls like a DJ mixing tracks. To quantify this madness, we delve into stability derivatives. Sounds like alien jargon, right? It's just complex math predicting how the plane reacts to every twitch. We're turning a chaotic dance into a mathematical symphony because why not? And then there's trim, the plane's perfect balance. Like finding that sweet spot where everything clicks. Of course, this spot shifts faster than a politician's stance thanks to fuel consumption, speed changes, and even passenger movement. It's a constant, delicate balancing act, keeping our metal birds gracefully soaring. Angle of attack and stall. So, you think stalls and spins are just dramatic scenes in movies where the hero pulls out a nosedive at the last second? Think again. The reality of stall and spin accidents is far less cinematic and way more terrifying, because most of them happen at low altitudes where there's zero room for error. Back in 1949, the FAA decided spin demonstrations were too risky for most pilot trainees. Instead, they doubled down on teaching stall recognition and recovery. Makes sense, right? Well, sort of. While spin-related accidents have dropped, the ones that do happen tend to start below 1,000 feet, basically right in the middle of a traffic pattern where pilots are supposed to be at their sharpest. And here's a fun, horrifying fact. If you enter a spin at that altitude, your chances of recovering before hitting the ground are pretty much non-existent. The key players in all this? Angle of attack. This is the angle between the wing and the oncoming air. And if you push it too far, the wings just stop working. Most people think speed is the issue, but nope, it's all about the AOA. You could be going fast, nose down, and still stall if you yank back too hard. It's why buzzing the ground, trying to pull up at the last second is a terrible idea. Your wings will just quit on you and, well, gravity wins. Bottom line, keep those wings flying, understand your limits, and don't believe in Hollywood's version of stall recovery. Airspace Management Ever wonder how planes don't crash into each other? That's thanks to airspace management, the invisible traffic control systems of the skies. It ensures airspace is used safely and efficiently, preventing mid-air chaos. The problem? Everyone wants a piece of the sky. Commercial airlines, military jets, private planes, and even the occasional rogue weather balloon. ASM plays a high-stakes game of airspace Tetris, keeping flights from colliding while balancing military exercises, emergencies, and regular air traffic. ASM operates in three key phases. First, the strategic level, where global and national aviation authorities decide how airspace is structured. They allocate zones for commercial, military, and emergency use, ensuring a well-planned sky. Next, the pre-tactical level, where daily airspace schedulers create an airspace use plan, a dynamic blueprint showing which areas are open, restricted, or reserved. Think of it as an ever-changing map that pilots rely on to stay in their lanes. Finally, there's the tactical level, where real-time controllers manage unexpected situations. If a plane is in distress, they might deactivate restricted zones or reroute flights on the fly. This is where ASM turns into a high-pressure, real-world Mission Impossible scenario. Except instead of Tom Cruise, it's a team of aviation experts making sure nobody ends up in the wrong airspace at the wrong time. Without ASM, the sky would be absolute chaos. Instead, it's a meticulously coordinated system that keeps flights running smoothly. So next time you board a plane, remember, ASM is the reason your journey doesn't turn into a mid-air bumper car experience. Flight Envelope and Limitations Ever wonder why pilots don't just push a plane to max speed and see what happens? Well, there's a reason for that, and it's called the flight envelope. The invisible boundary that keeps an airplane from turning into an expensive metal lawn dart. It defines the maximum speed, altitude, and load factor a plane can handle before physics stops playing nice. Think of it like the speed limits, weight restrictions, and altitude rules that keep a plane from becoming a tragic news headline. Flying inside the envelope? Great, everything is working as intended. Flying outside? Well, let's just say if you hear alarms and feel turbulence, congratulations. You've just made aviation interesting in all the wrong ways. Exceeding the envelope can lead to stalls, structural failure, and the kind of problems that make passengers rethink their life choices. Because gravity is undefeated, the flight envelope matters more than most people realize. If a pilot ignores it, the aircraft might stall. Goodbye lift, hello sudden descent or outright break apart midair. That's why autopilot is programmed to stay inside the envelope, while manual flying requires actual skill and common sense. Yes, an airplane might survive outside its flight envelope, 
just like you might survive skydiving without a parachute. But do you really want to test it? Pilots are trained to keep things inside the envelope because exceeding it is the aeronautical equivalent of poking a sleeping bear with a stick. Now, who's up for a turbulence free flight? Navigation and Avionics Principles All right, let's talk air navigation, because flying is basically a game of don't get lost, don't crash, and don't run out of fuel. Sounds simple, right? Well, not quite. Unlike your road trip, where you can pull over and check Google Maps, pilots don't have that luxury. When you're thousands of feet in the air, figuring out where you are is kind of important, because if you run out of gas up there, you're not waiting for roadside assistance. So how do pilots make sure they don't end up somewhere they really shouldn't be, like the middle of the ocean with no landing in sight? It all depends on whether they're flying by looking out their window or using instruments. If they're relying on visual flight, they're basically playing an advanced game of connect the dots, with landmarks like rivers and highways. But if they're flying through clouds or at night, instruments are the only thing standing between them and an unscheduled meeting with the ground. Of course, it's not just about knowing where you are, it's about knowing where you will be. Pilots have to account for wind speed, altitude, and something called the point of no return, which is exactly as dramatic as it sounds. Past that point, and turning back is no longer an option. There is also the equal time point, which basically tells you whether it's faster to keep going or make a U-turn. Human factors and decision making Ever thought about the sheer mental aerobatics happening in a cockpit? It's not your casual toast or cereal decision making. It's aeronautical decision making, a high stakes game where every choice can dramatically alter the flight's outcome. Imagine juggling a million variables ill-defined problems, shifting goals, and a ticking clock. Stress much? Here's the truth bomb. We humans are delightfully flawed. We're wired with biases. Those sneaky mental gremlins. Confirmation bias. It's like wearing rose-tinted goggles, seeing only what you want, like a pilot ignoring storm warnings. Overconfidence bias. Turns us into faux superheroes, thinking we can handle anything. Then comes situational awareness the pilot's superpower. It's like being a detective, piecing together clues from clouds, winds, and engine sounds. A lapse here can lead to some serious questionable calls. And let's not forget teamwork. In aviation, it's a symphony of collaboration. Crews must share information, build a common understanding, and agree on a course of action. It's a high-stakes group project where lives are on the line. But here's the thing. Even with all these challenges, pilots make incredible decisions every day. They're trained to recognize their biases and manage their situational awareness. So next time you're flying, remember, it's not just about pushing buttons and pulling levers. It's about making smart choices, even when the pressure's on. And honestly, it's a miracle we get anywhere at all.